afternoon, brothers and sisters. Are you still okay? May you stand up for a while, stretch maybe, so that the blood circulation will again flow freely. Okay. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sustaining us up to this very moment. And uh, Lord, as we once again listen to a short lecture about United Prayer, I pray that you will enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. Please be with me, dear Lord, as you use me, that the words that will come out of my mouth will only be for the edification of your people, for the blessing of your people, and even, even myself, dear Lord, for I know that it is possible for you to even speak to me through me. For I do not desire to speak my words, but only your words. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may please be seated. How many of you have been here since Wednesday? Can I see the hands? How many of you have been here since last night? This morning? Okay. Most of us, if not all of us, have been able to hear at least two messages concerning prayer. And if you notice, the focus is on individual prayer, right? And uh, I believe that you are thoroughly convinced about the benefits and the importance of prayer in our lives as Christians. We cannot survive without prayer. Like breathing for our physical bodies, prayer is for our spiritual bodies. And uh, but this afternoon, the task given to me is to give a lecture on United Prayer. And I believe that all of us are not, I mean, we are all acquainted with what United Prayer is. So it's basically coming together in unity, praying together with one purpose in mind, most specifically asking for the Holy Spirit. You may not have joined the small group United Prayer, but are you aware that if you are following with the initiatives of the church, the World Church 777 Prayer Initiative, that is also United Prayer. We are all in different time zones, and it's like all over the world, if we are faithful in, in adhering to that 777 prayer time, all around the world, every hour somebody is praying for the outpouring of the latter vein. Not only that, we have participated as a church here in PIC in the 10 days of prayer at the beginning of every year, right? Have you been blessed by those initiatives, brethren? I hear nothing. I believe that you're, you, if you're part of that, you will surely be blessed. What else? In March 25, the church has initiated the 100 days of prayer in preparation for the general conference session that is happening in July 11. So from March 25 to July 11, our church is praying unitedly for the outpouring of the latter rain. There are a lot of issues that are dividing the church right now. And it is really, really important that we unite together, we pray together, for the outpouring of the latter rain, for we, we have, I believe that that truth has been established now, that it is the Holy Spirit that we need. But I believe it will still help to hear some reminders about the importance of praying unitedly. Um, in Matthew, in Matthew 18, verse 19, Please open your Bibles with me. In Matthew 18, verse 19, Jesus is talking about prayer, and he said there, 18, verse 19, Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is 
in heaven. And in verse 20, he says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. How beautiful it is to realize that when, when two of us agree on one thing, the Lord listens and he answers our prayers. He delights for us to come together in unity to bring to, to him our petitions. And the beautiful thing is when we come together, he himself is in our presence. Surely, all of these initiatives by the church for us to come together, to pray together, is an evidence that as a church, we are taking seriously the truth of what she said, what she wrote back in 1887. She wrote, I believe that we are all familiar with this, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. So again, so again what is our greatest need? It is revival of true godliness how is it obtained what are the conditions for obtaining this revival of true godliness it is by confession humiliation repentance and earnest prayer we can only do these things on our knees amen only through prayer can we do this and the Bible also speaks about this. I will only mention a few verses. We don't have a lot of time. In 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, the Lord promised to Solomon when he was talking to Solomon, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. These are the conditions presented that must be met if we want revival among ourselves, among us as a church. And you just imagine, these words were penned in 1887. How many, how many years ago was that? I failed to compute, but that is more than 100, uh, close to 130 years ago. If it was true then, how much truer is it today? The beautiful thing is, when we look back in history, we will find out that revival always comes. True to what Mrs. White said, it really always comes in answer to prayer. A preacher also wrote that. She, he said, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. That applies true to our world today and even in the biblical world. And so, looking back in history, I believe that we are all familiar with the story of the, the apostles, that before Jesus went up to heaven, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, you stay in Jerusalem until I give to you the Holy Spirit. And I am so happy that Jesus I believe did not give specific instructions for them, for, for, for them to do. He just told them, stay in Jerusalem, do not go out yet, do not preach the gospel yet. Stay in Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit to be outpoured. And while waiting, they were in the upper room. They, they were there in one accord, Acts 1 Chronicles, that 
And we know the story that when they were united, that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And we know the results. In one, in one day, Peter preached a sermon. How many were baptized again? 3,000 people were baptized in just one day. Have you ever seen something like that in our day? Do you want to see something like that in our day? Amen? We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be united. And we can never be united if we are not on our knees. If one person who is praying will be used by the Lord to powerfully effect the world, then how much more if two or three or more than three will come together and unite to ask the Lord for the conversion of people, for the preaching of the gospel so that the, the work will be finished in this world and we will go home. Who among you would want to go home? I really want to go home. I say that I think maybe five or three to five times a week to somebody. I want to go home. I want to go home. And then I realize I'm very selfish. You know why? A lot of people have not heard of the gospel yet. Even among our, ourselves here in AUP, a lot of people are still blind. They have not known Jesus for who he truly is. And God is just waiting for us, his people, to unite with him so that he may use us. It is really ironic. It is really ironic how we call God, the Lord, our Father, and yet we do not, we have divisions among ourselves. Let us admit that. Even in the dorms, how, how many of you girls really love your roommates or your CR mates in the other room? Or your teacher who gave you a bad grade? There, there, is, there are a lot of divisions in, in, in among ourselves. And the Lord is waiting for us to be united because it is only when people are united that the Holy Spirit is being poured. Unity can only come when people are humbled before the Lord. I'm trying to shorten my presentation. They're giving me signal to stop. So what I can, if we try to summarize, the Lord wants his people to be united. In fact, in, in John 17 is a chapter long record of Jesus praying for us his people, he was actually praying for his disciples back then, but I am thrilled to find out that I am also included in that prayer. But in particular, let us read, read John 17, verse 11. John 17, verse 11, and we can see here the desire of Jesus to be one with his children, to be one with us. He said in verse 11, John chapter 17, verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. He wants us to be one as we are one with him. Let's jump to verse 21. He continues to pray that they, oh, let's include verse 20, talking about us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that is talking about us. 21, that they may all, they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. It is <coughs> really, <coughs> pardon me. It is really beautiful 
when we, when we see the unity of the Trinity, they're really one in everything. They're one in purpose. They're one in, in their actions. They're one in thought. They're one in their love towards us. And they want us to be like that. We know the story in John chapter 13 where they, look, going back to chapter 13 of the book, John again, we know the story where uh, Jesus and his disciples, after doing ministry, they came to a house in the upper room to have supper, but nobody was willing, this was the last supper, nobody was willing to wash each other's feet, and it was Jesus who initiated the work of the lowest of the lowest of slaves. That is, the work of the slave to, to wash feet of the guests. He did that because he is humble. And so, to sum that up, in verse 35, Jesus said to them, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. In a lot of instances also, in the, in the writings of Paul, he talks about, about being united, being united with one another. He also urges them to pray for him and his ministry because he believes that when, when people unite in their petitions to God, the Lord is desirous to, to answer. I'm being asked to end. I don't know how to end this. Um, can I ask for mercy, please? Are you okay if we extend for a little while? I have not wrapped up what I'm saying yet. Thank you so much for the timekeeper. You're very faithful in your work. I appreciate you for that. So let me just read these quotations. They're really beautiful. Dwight Moody said, I believe you've heard of him. He said, where there is union, I do not believe any power, earthly or infernal, can stand before the work. When the church, the pulpit, and the pew gets united, and God's people are all of one mind, Christianity is like a red-hot ball rolling over the earth, and all the hosts of death and hell cannot stand before it. It is really beautiful. More. It is in the fellowship of loving and believing prayer that our hearts can be melted into one and that we shall become strong in faith to believe and to accept what God has promised us. One last quotation. The strength unity gives is something inconceivable. The power of each individual member is increased to a large degree by the inspiration of fellowship with a large and conquering host. It was as the disciples were all with one accord in one place on the day of Pentecost that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. United prayer brings the answer to prayer. Andrew Murray penned these words. And we know, looking back at history, when people humble themselves before God and before one another, the Holy Spirit is poured. And we heard Brother Ron quoted a uh, what Mrs. White has written, that when we faithfully pray and the Spirit is outpoured upon us, He brings with Him a train of many blessings. And that includes strength to live the Christian life, and more importantly, the Lord is able to use us to finish His work on earth. That is the purpose. So, united prayer... We go through the four main themes, adoration and praise, confession, supplication, and thanksgiving. Adoration and praise focuses on the attributes of God. We praise Him. We are encouraged to enter His courts with praise and thanksgiving. And it is really amazing when we focus on praising Him, not only on asking, we find more reasons for which to praise Him. I even have a testimony yesterday. This week, in fact, we have been having prayers every morning around 5.30, and we are being blessed with, with, uh, with praying with one another. Our faith, our faith is strengthened, and yet 
Yesterday was really, really special. Brother Ron talked about the story of found in 2 Chronicles 20, 20. I believe that you're familiar with that. Is it, who is a king again? It's not Hezekiah. Again, I think this is what happens when you get rattled. 2 Chronicles 20, verse, the whole chapter, we know the story. I believe that we are quite familiar with this. Jehoshaphat was the king, and three nations conspired to come against, against the kingdom. Ammonites, Moabites, and the people from Mount Seir. You know what happened, right? Jehoshaphat, instead of calling for a meeting with his, what do you call them, military people, he called the people for prayer, for united prayer. And their prayers were really heartfelt. I am really amazed. I know that Jehoshaphat is not, he was not a new king when this happened. He did not depend on his strategies to protect his kingdom. He depended on God. He has that humility to say, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Can you imagine that? It takes a lot of humility to be able to say that. You're a king and you're saying you do not know what to do. Surely you have some experience in the past, but he did not, he did not rely on his own strength, on his own experience. He just called for the people to come and they, they laid themselves before the Lord. They laid their problem before the Lord. And sure enough, we know the result. Have you ever seen an army being led by a choir, singing praises to God. They were just singing praises. And it's really amazing. When we, when we start praising the Lord, I believe He's like encouraged to do, to do His work, to do things that He is good at. He's good at guiding us, at delivering, delivering us from any trouble that we have. And that's what He did when they were praising Him. Moab and Ammon united to kill the people of Mount Seir. After the Mount Seir people were gone, they started helping to finish off one another. Isn't that amazing? And then, instead of going through the four themes of prayer yesterday, we only had praises. Oh, believe me. The Lord broke my heart down. He revealed Himself to me afresh yesterday. For when we start praising the Lord, we we see how big he is and how small we are and how small our problems are. We are given a right perspective in life and we are assured that we have a God who is big, who is strong, who is compassionate. He's not only God, he's also our father. He is also our very best friend. Praising God brings us to humility. Second, confession. Confession do, does wonders. When we confess, we are urged in the Bible to confess our sins one to another, that we will be healed. The Lord also says that we need to confess our sins so that nothing will stand between us and Him in Isaiah 59 verse 1. And a lot of reasons. But what I find with confession is sometimes there really are there really are sins that do not need to be confessed publicly we are not being asked to do that in united prayer in congregational prayer we are encouraged to confess our sins but we have to be very careful that the sins that that uh, that must be confessed only between us and god must be done privately only public confessions must be done publicly. And yet, in my personal experience, the Lord called me to confess publicly something that will actually make other people fall when they hear about that confession. But I believe that I was led through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit to confess that, and they were protected by the Holy Spirit. They did not stumble because of that. 
But I believe that it is also the Lord's way to humble me. That's why he allowed me to, to go through that confession. So confession is very, very effective in humbling us before one another and before God. Can you just imagine praying together? The Lord, the Holy Spirit convicts you while in that united prayer that you have sinned against this brother or sister. You pray during that prayer. You ask for confession before God and before that brother or sister that you have offended. And healing comes. It is really, really beautiful. But we are scared sometimes of confessing publicly our sins because we hold on too much to that picture of respectability. We don't, we don't want to appear vulnerable. We don't want to appear like we have failed. It is easy for us to testify about how the Lord has used us to bring souls to his kingdom, how he has given us victory over something, but we are very hesitant. We are very, very hesitant to bring our confessions in public because we are scared of being looked down by others. But we need to be humble. We need to be humble. And if the Holy Spirit is convicting you to confess a sin publicly, do it. It is for the good of your soul. It is for the blessing of others. Another thing, it sets us right with our fellow human beings. It also sets us right with the Lord. So any barrier that, that the enemy may bring in order to cut the communion with God, that will be broken down through confession, through humiliation. Amen? The next session is supplication. Well, we are all good at supplication. But supplication, supplicating, bringing our request before God should also humble us. It should make us realize that we have nothing. We are nothing without God. That's why it is really, really important to ask the Lord to teach us how to pray, to ask Him to inhabit our hearts so that we may know how to pray in accordance to His will. And the Bible has a lot of promises. If we ask in, accordan in accordance to God's will, He answers. It is really beautiful when during United Prayer, sometimes as a leader, I am, I am compelled to mention like, Lord, would you please help us to pray the prayers that you love to answer. Inspire us to only pray prayers that you will delight to answer. And he does that. Every time, every time he does that. And the last again is thanksgiving. To differentiate adoration and praise with thanksgiving, Adoration and praise talks more about praising Him for who He is. Thanksgiving is praising Him for what He does. And so this means of coming together with this organized, somehow organized way of praying brings us to humility before God and before one another. And we know the result. If we humble ourselves before one another, before God, he unites us, not only physically like this. Somehow we're united. Sabbath, we're all together. We're praying. I were worshiping him. We're here, we are here listening to a lecture, to sermons. But it's possible to be sitting together in one pew and yet you're not united one to another, right? But united prayer is one powerful means of setting our hearts right before one another, before God. We get united. He delights us to get united. And he brings upon us the Holy Spirit and the work speeds up really fast. Because that's when we realize that all the work that we have been doing previously is done in our strength. But if we realize that uh, the Holy Spirit is able to use us if we're willing, then the, the, the results will be marvelous. The previous nights I have spent in reading about revivals all over the world, and uh, 
it's like it is only in the early 1900s that there's a world there's a big wave of revival that happened in the Christian community meaning there's nothing like that yet in our century how do you how would you like to be part of a revival that will sweep our world in this day and age how would you like to be part of that do you want to be a part of that can i see your hands by god's grace we will praying is not an easy task praying if done correctly really brings us humility it levels us down to nothingness we realize that we are nothing we have nothing apart from him we have no righteousness apart apart from him we have no power apart from him and so if you want to learn more about united prayer there is actually a booklet but we don't have it <laughs> but there's a pdf you may you may check in the revival and reformation website of our church um i forgot the title but the title of this booklet is praying for rain you may use this as your guide and it will help you in introducing united prayer in your church in your small group in your wherever the lord will call you to share this to other people a blessed blessed presentation which some of you may have seen also is the newly released video entitled what might have been it is a vision of mrs white uh, seeing what could have happened had the leaders of the general conference back in the uh, the session in 1901 what could have happened if they humbled themselves before one another and before god you check that out it is really really beautiful it mrs white really says that had our church done our, its work faithfully had the church done her work faithfully jesus could have come even back then he could have come even back then just imagine that there could have been no world war one world war two and a lot of heartaches a lot of pain that is that we're still experiencing up to this time had they been faithful could it be that the lord is calling us in our generation to answer the call for being used by god to call for revival in our day and age so that the holy spirit will truly be poured out upon us not only individually but as a church and that the work will be finished that is my prayer <laughs>